Hey, Keith, I think today we should talk about some of the knowns, but also some of the unknowns. The unknowns of what? <laughs> well, it turns out there's a fair number of things that we don't know for sure. We have theories and hypotheses, and I kind of want to set us up with how we're thinking about some of the unknowns. And specifically, I want to talk about the physical effects for neuromodulation, because I think there's a lot that's known about like what, what is it ultimately, well, I don't know if I'd say a lot, but some that's known about like what is ultimately happening with behavior or happening with you know, circuits, but like what's actually happening on the, you know, uh, the physical effect level is a little unclear. Yeah, that's probably one of the most common questions people ask, how does this actually work? And then Kim and I probably never have a concrete answer, but we like to guide people in this direction. So a lot of equations today, and then some hand waving after that. Maybe. Yeah, it's really important too, because people want to know, like, what parameters do I use in order to have an effect? Well, we don't really know how to think about the parameters completely until we have a really good idea what the physical effect is. And that's where we're a little shaky. So I, th I would say right now we're just, the field is working it out. Mm -hmm. Okay, let's talk about it. All right. Um, in fact, this is kind of, you know, as an introduction to it is we sort of break things down to these different levels that there's the, the physical effect, like what's happening. And that's where we're going to focus our, our discussion today. So we're going to talk about radiation force and cavitation and temperature. And then as you move on up, tell us about the rest, Keith, you go here. <laughs> we're going to look at the biophysical mechanisms. That's like, what is the membrane of a neuron actually sensing and why does it activate in response? And then neural mechanisms, I think we'll get more in terms of like Leonard's work. We'll interview uh, Leonard Verhagen, who does a lot of whole brain fMRI investigation of circuits. And then the behavior, I think we have a whole nice lecture on of what are we trying to record as an outcome, sort of the what is happening. And Kim mentioned, we're really good at measuring the what's happening, but we're not so sure on the why it's happening. Yeah. So we're going to talk about all of this in the rest of the class. And then today, let's just uh, go here. And then next week, we're going to move on up to biophysical mechanisms. OK, so this is our outline for today. we got a lot to talk about. Some of it we've covered already, so there's going to be a little bit of repetition. So we're going to talk about the physical effects here. So first of all, absorption, and what does that lead to? Temperature and radiation force. Then we're going to talk about cavitation, particle displacement. And then we're going to review data for and against and a few other things. OK, you ready? Sounds good. <laughs> okay. So let's talk about absorption. And, you know, I think we talked about this already. So in some sense, this is a review, but let me just kind of go through it anyway. And I like to bring in the illustration of the child on the swing because we put energy into the system by pushing the child. The child is going to oscillate around some uh, equilibrium position. And that's in the absence of any losses, but there are going to be losses. And because of those losses, there's going to be an amplitude decrease, which means that they're going to oscillate at about, about a position which is actually forward of the um, equilibrium position. And so there's kind of a net displacement forward. So there's losses, friction and wind resistance. And that's what we're going to see is there's losses going to give rise to temperature. And then there's going to be a net displacement forward. Okay, so those are our net results. And so that's what's happening with ultrasound. Tissue is viscous. There's a resistance to deformation. And so it's going to end up uh, sort of absorbing uh, heat. Can't really appreciate it on this sort of time scale. We often picture it as if the molecules are oscillating back and forth around their zero position. But if you sort of think at a sort of larger sort of zoom out in both space and time, and, you know, so it's easy to understand what I mean when I say zoom out in space, right? So what we have is a, is a focal spot here. It's going to heat up, which is why it's, it's the, in this animation, it's colored red. But when I say zoom out in time, so I mean kind of in your mind, you're, you're averaging over a larger time frame. And so those molecules have a net displacement forward. The net displacement forward is bigger at the focus where the intensity is bigger. And then there'll be some relaxation of the tissue. It'll relax kind of slowly. That's what the viscous part of viscoelastic means. Elastic means it'll go back. Viscous means it goes back slowly. There's some resistance to that change. And then you can see there's a shear wave that gets generated as well. So here we can't see any of the oscillations on like the very fine time scale, right? That's right. Those oscillations are happening over microseconds. And what we're doing now is we're looking over sort of the second time scale. And over a second, those oscillations average out and you just see that sort of forward momentum. Okay. 
Very nice animation, by the way, Kim. It's spectacular. Thank you. It's one of my favorite software. It's, uh, it's called Kinemac. And um, yeah, we can talk more about Kinemac in it offline. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so this is what's happening with absorption. And we know it's going to give rise to temperature and radiation force. So let's talk about those two effects. Um, so this is a focused ultrasound temperature rise in a phantom. So this is just the first time frame where we're going to apply the ultrasound over 10 seconds. This is what it looks like initially. I'm not quite sure if the transducer is above or below. It's got to be one or the other because of the way it's focused, uh, or the way that the focal spot looks. And you see something that looks like this. And, and, and this is really interesting to me because the, the shape that you see, this is just one time frame right here. The shape that you see is clearly that it's, you know, it's long elongated here. So clearly the, the transducer has to be either above or below. So there's, there's no other questions there. But also the way you can see sort of the, the shape of it kind of, um, uh, you know, doing something, oh, I'm terrible at drawing, aren't I? Uh, something like that. And so, and that's what our simulations say that the intensity is actually doing. So it's nice to see that sort of verified in the temperature map. So the shape is pretty interesting, but I also want to talk about what happens over time. So we, we played that movie, it's played again right here. Um, we see something happening over time. So it initially it will peak at the center, and then as the center part goes down, you see that the heat moves out. So these are different profiles. What I've done is I've taken a, a profile through the center here, and that first time frame is shown in black. And you see that it's not very high. Uh, and then the second time frame is that uh, the time point here, which is the, the darker red color. And you see that's where it got to be very, very hot. And then the center part is decreasing over time after that as it's decreasing. But what's really interesting here is if you say, well, what's sort of like the full width half max? So initially it looks like that. And then at the, the peak, it looks, uh, or maybe this is the, the redder color right here. Um, it looks uh, like that. So let me get rid of all my drawings. And then at the last time point shown here, the pink looks like that. So what we see is that the full width half max is growing over time. So that's telling us sort of looking at the, those plots, exactly what we know when we look at the, the movie is that that peak is gonna go up and come down and the, the heat is gonna spread out. How does it uh, spread out? Like, what are different mechanisms for that to happen? Okay, so that's really important that you ask that. And I'm going to get into the bioheat transfer equation in the next slide. The basic idea is whenever there's a spatial gradient, so it's high in the center, it's less high at the side, there's a spatial gradient of the temperature, there's going to be energy in the form of heat flowing from the region of high temperature to lower temperature. And then if you look at that peak part, if you just look at a, um, the center part, then you see something that looks like this. So when the ultrasound is on, it, it rises. And then when you turn it off, it will decay over time. There's a couple of points that I wanna make here. One of the points that I wanna make is that this is kind of a slowish process. Temperature is a bit slow. And by slow, I mean that if you, once you turn it off at the 10 second mark, then what you see is that it takes about 10 seconds here for it to go back down to sort of half maximum. You know, it's not a terribly high temperature rise. This phantom is just a gel phantom. There's no perfusion going on here. So we're just looking at sort of conduction of um, the heat away from the center due to conduction. And it's a bit slow. It takes about 10 seconds to decay back to half maximum. What's the word perfusion, Kim? Okay, we're going to get to this in just a moment. I know I'm using words before I've defined them. hate doing that, but hang on just a second. It's coming up sure, in one sure. slide. <laughs> and the point I wanted to make here is that if you look in vivo, so this is a temperature map in the brain during an essential tremor treatment. And then this is a time course that we see on the right from that. And we see that it went up from 37 degrees up to about 57 degrees over the 10 seconds, and then it decays away. And here it's going to decay away a little bit faster. So it goes down to about half maximum over three seconds, but I would still characterize this as slowish. Like if you look at it over one second, it's pretty still high. It hasn't decayed very much. If you look over a hundred milliseconds, not a whole lot has changed. So I think if you can define, you know, a time frame that which is much smaller than that, than what you're seeing here, then you can say, well, things are relatively constant. We'll come back to that in just a moment. But what you asked me is a little bit more about kind of general heat flow. Uh, 
So this is what's called the bioheat transfer equation. And this is what generates all of what we've been talking about so far. So there's a, a heat change term. And, and what does that depend on? Well, there's a number of things. It depends on the heat deposition, what you put in. That's the focus ultrasound going on. We're putting heat into the system. There's the conduction term. So that's where molecules, wait, I have these all defined actually on slides. There's the conduction. This occurs when the gradient in the temperature within the tissue itself that drives the heat flow. So that's where molecules will give heat to the next molecules beside them and they give the heat. So it's, you know, they're randomly moving around, they bump into each other, they give the heat off and heat flows from one set of molecules to the next kind of moving out. Now that's different than a convection term. So convection is when there's currents. So for example, if there's air currents in the air, you know, you have your, your ice cube and there's air currents that take the heat away, that's different than molecules giving the heat to the next molecules beside them. So convection is a faster process and it can take heat away much more quickly. Here, the convection term is perfusion. So the perfusion of blood. And then when we sort of replace convection with perfusion is uh, what um, is now called, we now have what's called the Penny's bioheat equation. So there was a, a, a researcher named Penny's who said, well, let's put in the perfusion term. And he gave some numbers to perfusion. And then that's what gave uh, rise to the Penny's bioheat transfer equation. And, and when he added that term, he found that it was more uh, like the simulations were more accurate with reality. Is that yeah. why that sort of stuck? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because um, basically that perfusion term is the difference between the plot we see here, where it goes down to half maximum in about a second, versus mm -hmm. what we saw in the phantom, where it went down to half maximum over three seconds. So it speeds up that decay process. It takes heat away pretty, okay. you know, pretty and, quickly. And really quick, so the blood is near the heated tissue, and it's either receiving temperature increase directly from the ultrasound or from the neighboring tissue and then it's flowing away, taking the heat with it. Is that right? Yeah, so it's taking the heat away, um, right. So either it's in the area that got heated up, just like you said, so it's taking that heat away, or the heat that uh, as, as new, perf new blood comes in, it's cooler, and it's gonna get heat through conduction and then take that away. Okay. Yeah. Okay, so that's the general idea of what's going on here. And in the next slide, don't worry, this is the, the, the terrible equation, but um, it's not so bad because if you just think about the equation of the three, the four different parts that we've talked about, there's the heat change term, the heat deposition term, the heat conduction term, and the convection term, then it actually all kind of makes sense. We could go through it in detail, but I, I don't know if I really want to do that so much. I mean, it makes sense that, you know, we take the heat change term that has to have the specific heat of the tissue. You know, how much, uh, as you put heat in, what's the resulting change in temperature due to that amount of heat? Um, the heat deposition term, we could talk about that a little bit more. You know, it has to do with the absorption of the, uh, of the tissue. Then there's the heat conduction terms, has to do with the, the thermal conductivity of the tissue and then the convection term. So, you know, there's some constants in there. I think, you know, if you look at it a little carefully and spend some time, it'll all make sense. But what I want to do is make some simplifying assumptions. Okay. <laughs> I, I, <laughs> I, I can see you, your eyes lit up because you like the idea of simplifying assumptions. Okay. So what I want to assume, first of all, is that because this is kind of a slowish process and our stimulus is much faster than what I've talked about. So let's say our stimulus is over a hundred milliseconds or, or maybe 10 milliseconds, then that's much faster than sort of that decay, which I said was happening over seconds. Then let's set the conduction and the perfusion terms to zero because over that very short time frame, those would contribute very little. So now what we have is basically the change in temperature do, over time is related, is equal to a constant times the absorption of the ultrasound times the intensity over time. So the, the deposited intensity. Okay, so what we're looking at here is if we have a stimulus that lasts for 10 or 100 milliseconds, then we're going to define a stimulus duration. And over that time frame at the very end, the change in temperature at the end or very end is related to the now the integral of that. So this is going to be kind of the peak temperature at the end of the stimulus duration is a constant, the absorption of the tissue, and the integral of the intensity over the stimulus duration. Okay. You're with me? 
Because, mm -hmm. you know, one of the things that's confusing is that we have a lot of different intensities. So I'm going to define a few of those in just a moment. This is just sort of the intensity over time. The instantaneous intensity is a function of time. Okay, so first thing I'm going to do is replace the attenuation term, which has built into it a frequency dependence, and I'm just going to make that a little bit more explicit. So now we have the uh, um, uh, attenuation with the frequency that's explicit, so a sub zero is a constant frequency to the first power, and now we have is the temperature, so now this is going to be the peak temperature at the end of the stimulus duration, is the integral of the stimulus duration over time, a frequency that's to the first power, and then a constant. So where are we going with this? What are our parameters? Like what does the peak temperature depend on? Well, now we know it depends on the intensity that we apply. And if you apply that with some duty cycle, then it's gonna depend on that if, and it depends on the stimulus duration and it depends on the frequency. Okay. It makes sense. Very, All right. Nice. <laughs> I'm gonna digress for a moment and tell you about some uh, um, um, kind of some, uh, some terms that are very commonly used in ultrasound imaging, and then let's use them for us as well. So these are some definitions that are commonly used. Here we have our temporal characteristics of a pulse. This is our normalized pressure. There's two pulses shown here. And what you see is they're very short because what i have uh, using as my example is very short pulses like we use in ultrasound imaging, a few cycles and they're gonna be repeated. So uh, we have the peak compression uh, pressure. We have the peak rarefraction pressure, which is also called the peak negative pressure. If it's nice and linear, then you see that those numbers are gonna be very similar. Um, if it's, if it's nonlinear, we'll talk about nonlinear effects later, then um, they may be a little bit different. Um, okay, so then we have intensity. So we've already defined intensity as the pressure squared divided by the acoustic impedance. Here I was just showing you your normalized intensity, which looks more like the pressure squared. And what we see is we have our temporal peak intensity, I temporal peak. And then we have a pulse average intensity. So the subscripts there are PA and our temporal average intensity subscripts now the temporal average. So um, the pulse average is just obviously it's the average over the time that the pulse is on. And then taking into account the whole period, which is now defined as the pulse repetition interval, then you get the temporal average. So if you average across the whole PRI, PRI is one over the PRF, PRF is the pulse repetition frequency. Okay. Tim, when, when, uh, when do you find yourself using these terms the most and like what situations, like why do they become important in your work? Oh, you know, they're very commonly used in ultrasound imaging, and I'm going to tell you why they're important for us as well. Um, what we're going to talk about is how the temporal average is related to the temperature rise that we're going to expect to see. Um, also, for that term, a burst, um, it's a long pulse, but really note that it, it's not continuous, like there are little breaks in it. No, no, not really true. So in ultrasound imaging, a burst is a long pulse. A pulse is a short continuous sonication. So in ultrasound imaging, a burst is a continuous sonication. Oh, really? So it's yeah. uh, not arbitrarily defined the difference between them? In ultrasound imaging, a burst is a long continuous sonication as opposed to a short one. What is long? Um, uh, I don't know exactly, but I would say longer than, you know, 10 cycles or something. But um, it, it's interesting because we tend to use burst differently than in diagnostic ultrasound, where burst means that there's a pulse train. And I think the reason we use that is because of your function generator saying using the term burst uh, for mm -hmm. sort of a, a modulation that goes up and down. And so the function generator use of the term burst is different than in diagnostic imaging. And Ooh, which one yeah. are we going to be using for the course more often, you think? Well, I would prefer that we use, but that we don't use the term burst because it's obviously confusing when it's defined differently in two different places. Mm -hmm. I would prefer that we have, if we have a train of pulses, that we say it's a <laughs> pulse train. <laughs> or yeah, a train sounds of good. Yeah, because I'm already obviously on a different page than you. 
I just wrote a grant. I, I was saying burst all over the place, different definition. <laughs> I know. And it's because you see the function generator and I have a little bit more of diagnostic ultrasound understanding yeah. the background. And so that's where, yeah. You know what? This highlights something that happens in the field a lot is where people just are saying words and they're not really meaning the same thing. And it creates problems across like replicating papers and things like that. So actually we, we did this to show you how terminology is very important in getting things right. And how important it is to have a publication on standardized reporting for their, for um, uh, transcranial ultrasound stimulation. I know. <laughs> and you're working on that, that right? paper. <laughs> yes, you could write that. I will cite it. I'll definitely cite it. Okay, so um, just a couple other definitions. So the ISPPA is defined as the, um, the integral of the uh, spatial peak intensity over the pulse duration. And then the ISPTA is the integral of the spatial peak intensity over the whole stimulus duration. And so ISPTA, it could be defined as over the whole stimulus duration. So it could be the same as integrating over your PRI if you have consistent pulses. Okay, so that's a very useful term because people in diagnostic ultrasound understand it. Those who come to uh, ultrasound stimulation from a diagnostic ultrasound understanding understand what ISPTA is, but also because FDA kind of understands ISPTA. And so very useful term. So let's, let's use that term. And let's go back to what affects the temperature. Well, again, in the absence of conduction and perfusion, so we're going to say that because those are slow processes and because our stimulus duration is shorter, we're going to have our spatial peak temporal peak temperature is defined as a constant times the frequency times the integral of the spatial peak intensity integrated over this uh, stimulus duration. And now what we can do is we can substitute the ISPTA that we just found on the prior slide. And now what we see is a spatial peak temporal peak temperature. What we expect to be is our maximum temperature is related to our ISPTA, the average uh, intensity. Um, and then it multiply times this, the stimulus duration. So again, what does it depend on? It depends on ISPTA, stimulus duration, and now frequency. So all we really did was just took out that duty cycle dependence. But the other thing we did is we inserted a term which is commonly used, ISPTA, um, and also just kind of gave us the idea that the temporal peak is related to our temporal average. Good? Mm -hmm. Okay. All right, so let's say we have these different waveforms. One of them is on for 10 milliseconds with an amplitude of one. One of it's on, they're, they're all three, or the, and the, the other two are, are uh, pulse trains, and they're on for 10 milliseconds. There's a 50% duty cycle in the second one and a 10% duty cycle in the third. Because we've increased the amplitude there, then what we see is their ISPTAs are gonna be the same. And our expectation now is that the temperature rise at the end of that 10 milliseconds is gonna be the same. So in terms of temperature, these are essentially equivalent waveforms. And the reason why this is important is because one of the questions in the field is, are we doing anything differently if we change our duty cycle? And a little bit of a pet peeve of mine is when people change the duty cycle, but they don't keep ISPTA constant. So what you need to do is if you have a 50% duty cycle, you have to bump up the intensity by a factor of two in order to keep your ISPTA constant in order to have sort of an apples to apples comparison. Yeah, so if, if like the first uh, stimulus had the same effect as the last stimulus, you might conclude that it's temperature. But if they were different, I mean, what would be working on the system then? Uh, so these are all gonna have the same temperature rise. So um, if they're the same, would you conclude it's temperature? Not necessarily. You just, uh, um, it, it, might, it might be uh, related to temperature. Oh, if there is an effect, I guess. Okay, so there's other things going on. So my point here is that um, there could be a relation with temperature and, um, you need, we need to make sure that we keep the temperature uh, rise consistent when we change our parameters. If we want to say, you know, changing duty cycle has an effect on, uh, based on the mechanical force, then what we need to do is keep the temperature rise the same in order for it not to have a confound. So 
Yeah, I guess I was trying to push towards like the bottom plot here probably has more instantaneous like mechanical force on the cells. Do you think so? I do, yeah. Uh-huh. Well, let me give you the the whole um, rest of the lecture here and then let's come back and ask you if you still think that's true. Sounds good. Okay. <laughs> I'm now I'm really curious what you're about to say between these two, but anyway. Okay. Yeah, because it's sort of um I think what I'm going to suggest is perhaps a misconception in the field is that the lower one that you could have more mechanical effects and less temperature effects. And, and, and my point is going to be that temperature and mechanical effects kind of go together. They're very oh, much- Oh, sorry. I was different. saying that the difference between the first waveform and the last is mechanical, which we would obviously agree on, I think. No, I'm not going to agree with really? you on that one. Wow. No. Okay. I'm not I can't wait agree. till we get to cavitation. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so what I'm going to do in the next slide, next set of slides, is I'm going to say, let's talk about radiation force. And then we're going to come back to these three waveforms. And we're going to ask, what differs with these three waveforms with respect to the radiation force? But my point here before I finish is that I want to just say this one more time. Whenever you change your waveforms, you got to keep something constant. And if you want to exclude temperature as an effect, you need to keep the temperature effect constant. So that would mean that if you change your duty cycle, you got to up the amplitude so your temperature effect is constant. Okay, so that's the key here. And then also when you're thinking about temperature, you know, what affects it? Well, the temporal average, the stimulus duration, and then the frequency. Um, frequency, of course, because as you go up in frequency, there's more absorption for the same intensity. Okay, I think I've beat that dead horse enough, right? I can keep on going. <laughs> Next slide. <laughs> okay. All right, so let's talk about radiation force. We saw that before with the swing, there's going to be a net momentum forward. And, uh, and so what we see is the molecules are going to have a net displacement forward. All right, these displacements are really small. So I, I've actually amplified it or exaggerated it in that, ampl that, that animation right there. The displacements are on the order of microns. And so they're really small, but yet they can give shear stresses. And so if we were to think about, you know, at the peak of that uh, um, movement right there, there's a little bit of shear stress in the tissue. So if you have a, a micron change in one area compared to the other, then that's a, a, a shear stress of, you know, one micron over some distance. And that will give you this, the, the strain. I really want to get too much into um, stress and strain. Stress is sort of your applied and then strain is the result. So what you see is if there's a shear, the shear strain is sort of how much that tissue is shearing over some distance. Um, this is a nice example. We've talked a little bit about how water is not very viscous. And so water is a terrible example, uh, except for the fact that the surface of water, I don't know if I would, I wouldn't say it's viscous, but it kind of mimics a viscous material because at the surface, since those water molecules only are near water molecules on the one side, they have a lot of connections to each other, more attractive forces, and that gives rise to surface tension. And because they're, they have that surface tension, then they're going to exhibit some properties that in my mind are very similar to the shear wave propagation. So let me play this animation. There's a drop, and then you see the, the waves that emanate out. And so in many ways, you see that initial deflection at the center from the force and then the shear wave propagation, much like we saw in our animation before. It's just a nice way for me to visualize it, even though I know that if you look in the center of the water, it's not very viscous and you're not gonna have the same effect. Okay, so we do know that in tissue though, because tissue has you know, um, molecules that are very, very large, and because there's a lot of attractive forces between tissues and a lot of bonding that when you have a, you know, you push on tissue, then you're gonna have, uh, you know, the other tissue get pushed and pulled with it. And that's what gives rise to those stresses and strains. So shear stress and shear strains. Um, but let's just talk about the radiation pressure. So when ultrasound is applied, the tissue absorbs momentum. So that's the, the radiation pressure. There's a, a coefficient times the intensity, and then you divide by the speed of sound. So um, different numbers here for what that coefficient is. 
if you have a, a perfect uh, absorber um, normal to the beam, then the coefficient is one. If you have a perfect reflector, so like an air interface, then that coefficient is, is two. It's like if you're in water and, you, and you're pointing up at the surface, then you're gonna have a, that coefficient be two. And that's why you see water molecules in the, um, the, de the humidifier. When you point up at the surface and humidifier and those water molecules come flying off is mm -hmm. because you're, you're throwing them off with this radiation pressure. And that's, it's not the same thing as steam. You can put your hand in it and it's cold, even though it's moisture coming off. And as the radiation pressure is giving energy to the water molecules at the surface and throwing them off. All right, in the middle of a medium, which is absorbing, it's a two alpha, two times the absorption uh, um, attenuation factor. And so um, we, could, we could go into like derive that, but I think I'm gonna not derive that and um, just ask you to kind of apply your intuition that it, it makes some sense that it's gonna be related to your, to the absorption. Okay, um, you've, have you heard of, do you have a radiation force balance in your lab? It, well, like I'm just looking at your picture. Is it just like a, a regular balance for weighing material? Yeah, in some sense it's a regular balance, but the way it's all set up, excuse me, it's sort of a radiation force balance. So the, the key idea here is that you hold the transducer uh, such that it, the transducer isn't resting on anything, so it's not applying any force. And then the balance is just measuring the water, the weight of the water. Then when you turn the ultrasound on, there's the additional radiation force from the ultrasound, and there'll be a deflection of the, the scale and it'll measure that as a force. Right it now, it's like gonna simple have... enough, like uh, the students could set, set this up in any lab, and maybe this could be like uh, related to one of their projects. Oh, yeah. Right? That'd be kind of fun. That would be kind of fun. We don't actually have a radiation force balance, so it'd be kind of fun to set one up. Hmm. Yeah, I mean, you're calling it a radiation force balance, but it's like a ring clamp, like stand, and then a scale. <laughs> so everybody <laughs> has one, really. <laughs> Yeah, and it would be nice um, uh, just to see it. To see yeah. that, that is true. It'd be fun. Okay, so that's the way that works. And it's a standard equipment in many labs, although I just said we didn't have one. <laughs> you could, I'm sure you could make one. You have one. Let's just say you have one. <laughs> All right, but just to convince you that this is, in fact, really a thing. Um, so this is a slide that, uh, the, the top movie was given to me by Steve Backus, where he did some work in the retina. He has some optical imaging in the retina. And when the white bar on the right goes on is when the ultrasound is applied. And I think that's right. Yeah, there we go. And we see that there's a distortion of the tissue. So there's, there's some strain that's occurring in the tissue that's different when the ultrasound's on than when it's off. It's a very clearly something's happening here with the radiation force in the retina. Um, another data point as to this is really a thing is in vivo, we can measure those radiation forces. So this is right down here, a large animal brain. And the left picture over here is where we put our focal spot. And the picture on the right is where we were sensitive to those micron displacements. And we measured kind of um, how much displacement there was and color encoded that. And you can see is basically giving us a picture of the focal spot. There's gonna be more displacement at the center falling off and we get a nice picture of the focal spot from sort of encoding that displacement. It seems a little magical. Do you think I should describe a little more how that works? I, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> just gonna say, I love this video up top. I mean, it's it was just like a really it's like nice to be able to see something happening because you can never see these little oscillations, you know, as the ultrasound's traveling. But you can yeah, see Yeah, you can't see those the the particle displacement oscillations, right? It's but a you little can more tangible. See the radiation force displacement. It's, it's really nice to yeah, make it tangible. But yeah, yeah, I totally agree. Um, okay, I'm gonna talk about the MRR fee because one, it's fun. Two, <laughs> It gives us a picture of the focal spot. There's things that you could think about doing if you have a picture of the focal spot. And um, three, you know, one of the things that we're working on is, would it be possible to figure out what the intensity of the ultrasound is there from that picture of the focal spot? Could we back out from that picture 
what the intensity was that actually reached the brain. Cause you know, we've talked in many times about how the, the skull is a variable filter and how, you know, it's not clear how much it takes out. And even though we can do modeling, there's still some uncertainty and wouldn't it be nice to make a measurement. And so this is one way to make a measurement. Okay, so a little bit of a digression here into how this works. So first of all, it's gonna start with magnetic resonance imaging. Magnetic resonance imaging is looking at water, water protons, protons in water. And, and with the protons in water, um, we can be sensitive to um, the, like where they are in the volume by putting on uh, changing a, a magnetic field that's a little bit different. And, and when they move through the magnetic field, we can be sensitive to that and encode that into the phase of the image. So that's essentially what's happening here. For those of you who know something about MRI, just very briefly, it's like a spin echo sequence. So you see there with a 9180, we have these motion encoding gradients. So it's actually a lot like a diffusion weighted gradient sequence. And we turn the ultrasound on for one of those motion encoding gradients. So let me back out and say, what we're essentially doing is our water protons, when they move to a new magnetic field because of the radiation force, because we're applying ultrasound coincident with that gradient so that when they move to a new position, they're gonna encode uh, that position into the phase of the image. So this is what we're gonna see in our movie right here. We're looking at a line of protons. They're all lined up. We turn the ultrasound on in the magnetic uh, field and they've encoded into the phase uh, that position, but it's only right at the focus. And so then it, if you look across the whole plane, you can make a picture of what that phase was. And in the phase of the image, we now have that displacement. For those who don't understand MRI so much, just hang in with me and kind of like, okay, great. We can get a nice picture of the focal spot. Um, just some other uh, things about it. Um, we actually use a slightly more complicated pulse sequence. I don't really want to go into that. The gradient is a little bit more complicated just to kind of reduce our motion sensitivity. And then something else is that it, as you increase the acoustic power, then we see that that displacement will increase linearly. So that's what makes us think, you know, would it be possible to back out what the, uh, the intensity is at the focus, given what that displacement is. It's a little complicated though. <laughs> well, the, the fit is like, it's already really good. So you can almost just use this equation, right? Or is that like cheating? Like, do you need to fundamentally know why this equation fits so well? So it turns out that if you keep your, fo your focus in one position and you change your power, you get something that goes up linearly. If you change your focus, then that changes for the same power what your displacement is. And um, you know this is why it's getting a little complicated. It could be that you've gone to some tissue which is more or less stiff, then it's gonna displace a little bit more or less. Or if you go to a, like a deeper depth, for example, what we know from the prior lectures is that we're gonna get a larger focal spot as we go to depth. Now you're, you're pushing more tissue and um, the kind of the dynamics of, of how the, the tissue responds to the same push is different because it's connected to other tissue that's also moving. And so it's so, kind of like moving a boulder is different than moving a, a stone. So we need to know not only the displacement phase, but we also need to know how stiff the tissue is to back out this acoustic power. Yeah. Okay. Challenging. Yeah, yeah, there. it's getting a little complicated, but... Anyway, some promise there, but um, work to be done. Okay, let's back up now. Radiation force. Okay, we know there's a radiation force. We've seen it with our own eyes. We saw it with the retina. We saw it with those pictures uh, in vivo. Um, and because there's that force, even though it's really small, there's very small stresses and then strains on our tissue. Keith, tell us why our tissues are sensitive to stretch or strain and very briefly because i know we're going to talk about this in the next two lectures yep so uh, of course the membrane senses mechanical tension by the activation of ion channels and you all know now that that affects whether a cell fires or not it's brief okay so we're going to talk that for two lectures give us a, a brief preview of what's happening in the next two lectures uh, well, so not the one for Wednesday, but for ones for next week. Yeah, so you want more detail. Okay, so we're going to go over different 
mechanisms by which the membrane senses strain and stress. I'm trying to figure out where Kim's asking me to go with this. But, but one way is that the membrane actually deforms and is tethered to these channels. So it sort of opens them up. And then another way of thinking is that the membrane is a, a fluid sort of mixing uh, media and that by mixing it, you're causing enzymatic reactions, which chemically open these ion channels. So we'll tell you about those two fields of thought. Okay, I'm really excited about that. You're not leading me to the right direction or that's no, what no, you're looking no, for? No, this is good. No, I'm okay, pretty good. excited about that because now that we've gone through this, we have a pretty good idea that there are stress, stress strains and that, and then I'm just dying to know how that affects the, the membrane. And, and I mean, I know that it does in this kind of superficial way, but I'm really interested to know like in more detail. So I'm super excited for those lectures. Okay, so we have a force. The force is related to the absorption and intensity. It gives rise to a displacement. The displacement is related to the intensity, so it's bigger at the, at the focus and then it falls off. And that's gonna give rise to strain. Now let's go back because remember you and I disagreed before about those three different waveforms. So let's revisit those three different waveforms. And I did a little simulation here. So I'm gonna tell you what I did and then we're gonna go through the results. So first of all, this is kind of just setting up what did I do? Uh, we have a, a driving function in time. So that's just saying that the ultrasound went on with an amplitude of one for about 10 milliseconds, and then it went off. And then we're just uh, leaving it off for some amount of time. And then we're gonna look and see what happens to the tissue. If you look at the center point, oh wait, some of you just say what the driving function. So if you look over, over here, we have what our driving function is. And it just uh, over some, you know, the, the spatial scale is over here now millimeters. And just, it went up very, uh, you know, it went up to the a peak and it's, it's very peaked over a couple of millimeters is our driving function in space. And so that's what we're, we're saying is our sort of our intensity coming in. And so what's the effect of that driving function as it's on for, um, 10 milliseconds. And then what you see is that peak uh, at that peak spot. So that we expect it right here at zero to go up the most, and then it's going to fall off as time goes down. And that's what happens here. So this is actually down here. If we look at this one, it's a 3D plot. And you see the center point now is going to go up sort of exponentially. That's what we see here. If we look at the center point going up, and then as you turn on down off the ultrasound, it's going to fall off. And so it falls off exponentially. And it falls off, this is similar to what happened with the temperature, but it falls off a lot faster. So these dynamics are a lot faster. I would say these happens over sort of tens of milliseconds as compared to temperature where it falls off over seconds. So, um, so now what we see is it falls, it goes up and then decreases exponentially at the focus. But if you look apart from the focus. So let's just look here sort of in the middle, or maybe we'll just look at the, the peak here, the, the peak at the 10 milliseconds. What we see is that uh, there's kind of a, a uh, hard to say exactly what the profile is. So let's, what we do is we'll say, let's look at three profiles, one that's come across here, one that's come across here, and then one over here. And now that's what we've plotted over here. So initially what we see at, at this point is just the center point is coming up. And then at the peak, we see something that looks more like this. So the center point has come way, way up, but it's also spread out. And that's because of those shear waves. So those shear waves are sort of causing the um, displacement to spread out over time. And then after we turn it off, the center part is going to decrease, but then those shear waves keep on happening. And so that's how we see that now the, the center part has come down and those shear waves are, are moving out. Um, is that making sense, Keith? So center part's gonna go up and the decrease, but as it's going up, just like with temperature, we see that the tissue, that that, that uh, um, displacement is gonna move out in the way, in the form of a shear wave. Mm -hmm. Okay, so similar to temperature, sort of, but it's happening over a faster time frame which is gonna be important. But now what I wanna do is we're gonna talk about those three different cases. Are strains the same or different? These are the, this is what I wanted to get at, uh, those three different cases with the temperature. Um, just, I ended up doing something very similar, but slightly different. 
Um, I, I wanted to make sure that we kept something constant. Of course, we wanted to keep the ISPTA constant. Um, and so uh, I had to just make sure that the, the amplitudes that we went to were such that the integral of the intensity over that uh, whole period was the same. These are now my driving functions, my three different cases that I looked at. And our, our driving function in space looks like that. And then the idea here is that um, you use a Green's function. And for those who don't know what Green's function is, it's, it's basically just a, a function that you convolve with your driving function in space and time, which essentially blurs out the result, which is what the bioheat transfer equation told us was gonna happen. I mean, it just said that heat's gonna go, oh, well, okay, so hang on just a second here because we shouldn't be referring to bioheat transfer when we're talking about mechanical effects. Um, but you know, it's, it's a similar idea. The Green's function means that uh, that the displacement is means because there is viscosity, it's going to pull the tissues beside it, and then um, that shear wave is going to develop. Is essentially going to, like I said, blur out over space and time. All right, you with me? Let's look mm -hmm. at our three different effects. Driving function is a constant, 100% duty cycle. Center goes up, it decays away over tens of milliseconds, and we get something that looks like that. Now, if our driving function is 50% duty cycle, the driving function in space is exactly the same. It just goes on and off, 50% duty cycle. Every half millisecond, it's on, and then it goes off again. And what you see is that it'll go up while the ultrasound's on, decays away a little bit, goes up, goes on. And essentially, you get something for that center point, like on the right, where there's similar overall uh, exponential um, increase. And then once you turn the ultrasound off, it has that exponential decrease. The only difference now is there's a little bit of a zigzag on top of what we saw before. If you look at the whole 3D, it's shown down here uh, below, and you see that very, very close to the center, it's gonna have that zigzag. But once you get a couple of millimeters away, is that's gonna get blurred out. And then those shear waves are gonna propagate out just like they did before. Go now to our 10% duty cycle. Again, we're gonna see that the amplitude is gonna go up following that exponential rise, but with a bit of a zigzag again. And then it's gonna have that exponential decay. And that zigzag is gonna be defined or confined to just the center part over just kind of a millimeter or so. And then as you move away, then that, that blurs out. And by the time the ultrasound's turned off, there's no zigzag at all, and it just decays away, and the shear wave moves out. So, as you change the duty cycle, if you keep your ISPTA constant, so you have similar heating, then there's gonna be small differences in displacement and strain. So what I'm showing here is displacement. Strain is gonna be the spatial derivative of that. So there's gonna be in those center, maybe millimeter, a little bit of difference because it's oscillating up and down. So a little bit of difference, although the overall effect is going to be, you know, the major effect is gonna be constant between them, but there's gonna be a little bit of oscillation in those center pixels. So the overall envelope similar, high frequency oscillation. Now we ask the question, do we really think that this is gonna have a big difference? You mean from a mechanical standpoint? Yeah. Okay, let me let the debate begin real short. If you look <laughs> at the total motion of the membrane, it's, it's straining and then it's relaxing, straining, relaxing. So if you measure that net displacement over time, you're actually getting much more with the zigzag. So the membrane's going in and out really quick. Whereas this one, it's just slowly moving out. So the distance traveled is much less than the figure on the far right. Also, we have to consider that mechanical includes things outside of strain and stress, like particle displacement, which Kim is gonna tell you about, and also cavitation, another thing Kim's gonna tell you about. Okay, that's my end of the debate. I'm gonna chop it there. What are your <laughs> thoughts? <laughs> okay, I do see gonna... what you're talking about though. The total strain is the same, which is interesting. I wouldn't have expected that. Okay, we're gonna ignore the other two things that Keith just said, because we're gonna cover those <laughs> in just a few minutes. But now the question is, really, um, you raise an interesting point. 
Okay, so the way I think of strain is sort of, if you look at the one over here, then, oh, let me get rid of those scribbles. Um, then it's strain is the spatial derivative of that. And, um, and so you could imagine in your mind what the spatial derivative is, sort of the slope of right here. And you could look at the slope here and the slope here and say, well, they're probably all very similar. But what Keith is saying is that um, if you look at it, the displacement and you, and you don't just say what's the kind of the displacement on this axis, but like the distance traveled because it's going up and down and up and down, then that that's meaningful. I don't really know how to think about that. You may be absolutely right. And I just have to think about that, you know, and maybe we'll think about that more in the upcoming lectures that you give us as to what could possibly be different between these three different waveforms as we're thinking about cells and neurons and ion channels. I, and we don't have a clear answer, unfortunately. <laughs> no, we I don't. Would, <laughs> you know, there's some work that says they're exactly the same. As you change your duty cycle, if you keep ISPTA the same, you get the same result. In fact, when we looked at the mouse and we looked at the EMG and their forearms and we said, well, you know, let's look at their, the, the movement of their, their forearms it was exactly the same. But there's been some more recent work showing some differences as you change duty cycle. Do you wanna maybe mention that? Yeah, no, I'm just thinking, I feel like there's an experiment we should do where we do 200 milliseconds and just literally do the pulse train that you were talking about. You know, just double the intensity and cut the duty yeah. cycle in half and keep yeah. the, the total. So something that's interesting, it's totally necessary, like Kim's showing here, you really need the total length of like whatever your protocol is to be the same. Because if you allow, like there's two ways to change the thing. If you have the same intensity and you have uh, different duty cycles, then you have to change the length of the stimulus. But you don't want to change that because the neuron has this sort of um, repolarization time that you have to deal with because that's what I was changing. Yeah, you want to keep your, your, like that that way. your duration the same. You do. Yeah. But up the intensity if you change the duty cycle. See, that's, that's a good idea. And I'm saying I haven't done that in the past. Um, <laughs> I've actually changed the length of the stimulus to account for the change in intensity. Yeah. And that was a mistake, clearly. Yeah, I think so. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, that'll be a fun experiment. It yeah, we're getting be. in the weeds here, though. Yeah. All right. So this is what we need to think about as we go into those upcoming lectures. And um, as we look at the literature, and, and you'll find literature. And, and in fact, there's some nice uh, summary papers saying, you know, high duty cycles, stimulatory and low duty cycles, inhibitory. And I think we need to think of the pretty critically about what are those parameters? Did they keep ISPTA constant? Because if they didn't keep ISPTA constant, then they could have a different heating effect. Mm -hmm. And then it changes things, you know, have the confound. So, all right, that's my, my little pet peeve that I know. Yeah, okay, that's, so. I mean, that's what's so exciting about the field is like, they're very simple things to work out. We just need a really good way to measure the outcomes. And that's what people are developing now. And all of you in the course here can develop that as well. Kim has given you nice tools to do so. Hey, these are really nice plots. Can I show you something about these? Yeah, absolutely. So if I select one of them, then I can sort of like move it around and look at it. Isn't that cool? Yeah, that's awesome. How do you do that? <laughs> <laughs> How can I do that? I really want to do that. <laughs> so I made those plots in Excel. Uh, because I'm very conversant with Excel, but then I put it into numbers. So numbers is the Excel version of, um, you know, Keynote and pages. And, um, and then it has this 3D function that you can move around. I wasn't able to find that in Excel. So anyway, that was kind of cool. And plus yeah, it, cool. it, it works nicely in, in Keynote. All right, so we move on. Um, I don't want to bore the students. <laughs> yeah. Okay, we got to talk about cavitation, particle displacement, and then review the data for and against. Okay, so cavitation. What is cavitation? And then why are we talking about it? Okay, so first of all, 
what, what is a micro bubble? A micro bubble is a fragile viscoelastic resonator. That's a lot of words. I think we all know what bubbles are, you know, um, but what's really interesting is how they act under ultrasound. And so um, when the ultrasound's played, then the bubble will oscillate. And what's happening is when there's low pressure, then the bubble is going to expand. When there's high pressure, it contracts. And so you see this oscillation. But what's really interesting is sort of how it oscillates. So I'll get into that in just a moment. There's two types of micro bubbles. There's a gas bubble by itself. So like, for example, if you pull gases out of the tissue, you can create a, a gas bubble. Or there's bubbles that are in a shell, like a, a lipid shell. And those are the base, those, that's what an ultrasound contrast agent is. So you can inject a micro bubble that's encapsulated in a lipid shell. And um, we don't really wanna talk about those. Really what we're interested in is the thought of how gas is created um, and by, uh, sorry, how the bubble is created by pulling the gases out of the tissue. Um, so the term cavitation refers to many things. <laughs> <laughs> which is, I find very confusing. So it refers to the development of bubbles, the growth of bubbles, the oscillation of bubbles and the collapse of bubbles. And so it's very confusing to use that term for four different things, don't you think? Yeah, sure. Um, and then within the, ter the, uh, the oscillation of bubbles category, there's stable cavitation, which means that bubble will oscillate nicely and just kind of keep on oscillating. And then there's inertial cavitation where it'll um, oscillate, but then it'll collapse very violently. Have you seen those videos about, I think they're called pistol shrimp. And then the pistol shrimp can uh, you know, create a, a, an inertial cavitation event that shocks its prey uh, by mm -hmm. creating a shock wave, making that, that very violent collapse. And um, just just to be clear, because people are seeing this and thinking that looks violent. So when Kim says collapse, she doesn't mean that it's simply getting smaller. There's this weird process that happens. Kim, you can describe it with the Taurus. And it's oh. not what you're seeing in the video. Yeah, but it definitely has, it can be very violent. It can go up to high temperatures. It can have very, very large forces. And the, you know this was um, often described with respect to uh, propellers. You know, the Navy had a lot of uh, research into this. In fact, um, Larry Crum, who's the University of Washington that I know pretty well, had a, did a lot of research on that. And it was because the, the bubbles that were created by the propellers would um, have this violent collapse such that it sort of pitted the propellers. And not only that, but then it gave off a, kind of a, an ultrasound signature that could be detected by other submarines or, you know, other ships or submarines. And so, um, you know, it's something that the Navy was very interested in. Okay, so let's keep on track here. Um, the collapse of bubbles is also um, often referred to as inertial cavitation, as well as the oscillation that results in the collapse of bubbles. What we're really interested in is, is this development of bubbles and I'm gonna call that rectified diffusion. It is called that, so it seems to have two different terms. Let's call it rectified diffusion to make it clear what we're talking about. And this is something that Larry Crum did a lot of nice work um, in as well. In fact, he gave me that movie, the, that bubble oscillating. Um, okay, so let's talk about rectified diffusion. This is the idea that there are gases dissolved in our tissues and in the low pressure part of the ultrasound, that gas is gonna get pulled out of the tissue and forms a bubble. So let's ha have a little picture here. We've got a low pressure phase. We're gonna uh, pull those gases out of the tissue and they're gonna accumulate in what's a bubble. So there has to be kind of like a nucleation site or something that, uh, that allows it to, to form. And then the bubble's gonna start to grow during that low pressure phase. Then during the high pressure phase, it's gonna collapse a little bit. The pressure is gonna push it down. Then the low pressure phase, it's gonna expand a little bit more. And what you see is that over time, from one low pressure phase to the next, to the next, that bubble is gonna grow and grow and grow. And little confusing was to why it keeps on growing, because you would think, well, if the ultrasound is sort of symmetric, it's gonna get pushed down over the same time frame as the, the, the negative pressure phase when it can grow. But they don't, those two phases don't have the same effect. Because the surface area gets bigger and bigger, that growth has a larger effect. Like the surface area has a, a larger effect and it really promotes growth. 
Um, as it gets contracted down, the surface area gets smaller. So there's less area for the molecules to get pushed back into the tissue. Um, and so as, and then as it grows, there's more area for the, the, the molecules to come into the bubble. So you end up with a growth of bubbles. And then the other thing that happens is the, yeah, so the bubble size, as you can see there, is kind of grows over time. Um, and then, yeah, and then something else that's happening is that the, the bubble spends more time in the expansion part than it does in the contraction part. And that's also very interesting. Um, you know, so part of it is that, uh, did you want to ask a question? Yeah, I was going to ask, do you have another slide on this or no? Because if you do, I won't ask my question. I don't know. I do have another slide. <laughs> I'll wait. Yeah, maybe you already answered it. Okay. Go ahead. Sorry. What, what were you about to say, Kim? Okay. So um, one thing that's really uh, useful here is that this happens preferentially at lower frequencies. The effect is bigger with low frequencies because ultrasound's more time in the negative phase of the ultrasound cycle. And it's during that negative phase that the, the bubble will grow. So there's this frequency dependence, which is um, useful to us. Okay, so the idea here, why do we care about this? Well, they could result in, we'll, we'll talk about this in just a moment. Um, in fact, we'll talk about it here. <laughs> Why do we care? Um, mm -hmm. So there's a theory that um, we can have bubbles that potentially could be affecting our cell membranes. And there's a theory that uh, you can get um, that uh, rectified diffusion occurring within the cell membrane. And then that could have an effect either directly on ion channels or on the capacitance. Maybe, Keith, could you give us a, a quick summary on this? Okay, on the left-hand side, Kim's showing like a membrane and then what might be like an ion channel is that purple blob. And on the right, people were saying that there were small little dissolved gas bubbles between the lipid membrane, and that these actually served as the nuclei source that Kim mentioned to create these cavitation bubbles. So if you stretch the membrane out, you can change something like capacitance, you know, we've mentioned in the past, you can potentially lower it, or you can create tension and pull on the ion channels and open them. Um, I don't like, I don't see why you know, these, these bubbles would be between the lipid membrane, which is very, you know, hydro, I guess, phobic. So I actually didn't believe any of this stuff, but yeah. Okay. Just... So there's questions, there's a couple of questions here. And yeah. one of them is with the pressures that we're applying, do we expect there to be um, bubbles forming? And then the other one is why would they occur within the membrane? And I can't really answer either of those. I think the, the third question, which is if there was a deformation of the membrane, it's perfectly plausible that you could have an effect on mm -hmm. ion channels. Okay, that part I think makes sense that there could be. Yeah, that. yeah, we would agree. Okay, good. All right, so now let's go back. Um, you know, we're looking at very small intensities and do we expect there to be um, a rectified diffusion here? And, and if there was, could we measure something? So let's digress for a moment to ask about, could we measure something? Um, and that is just simply that if there are bubbles, we know this is true if you have injected micro bubbles or you know, if you have any bu bubbles, then the output is not proportional to the input. And I just mentioned how the bubbles spend more time in the expansion phase than they do in the contraction phase. And so as a result of that, that when you have ultrasound that, that hits the bubble and then gets reflected, it, it's not necessarily the same um, waveform in the, in the, during the, the high pressure phase and the low pressure phase. And in fact, this is very well established that if you give it a certain frequency, let's just say one megahertz, just because it's a nice round number, you give it one megahertz, that in the absence of bubbles, what you're gonna get is a, a lot of signal back at the fundamental frequency, which is what you applied. But when there are bubbles, you're gonna get not back not just that frequency, but you're gonna get harmonics. Mm -hmm. And so that means um, multiples of that frequency. And, and this is um, very useful. It's very useful for when you've injected microbubbles, getting right. signal back from the microbubbles so that you can uh, uh, see them. And this is um, uh, uh, um, harmonic imaging in diagnostic ultrasound. And it allows you to see preferentially where the bubbles are because they're gonna have this har uh, the harmonics so much more than the normal tissue does. So there's a lot of fun, interesting stuff and harmonic imaging is now 
the way that ultrasound imaging is done on most systems. It's the default over um, sort of standard uh, looking at the fundamental frequency. But the question is here, if we, with our um, ultrasound that we're applying in transcranial ultrasound stimulation, creating microbubbles within the, the membrane, would we be able to measure something? We know we can measure it when you when you have injected microbubbles, and so we you know we tried to measure it, um, and and we found that we 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 didn't actually measure anything, but maybe those bubbles are like really small, and like not really giving very much signal, and so I don't really know what to say there. Hmm. There, there is still um, a thought that we need to keep our ultrasound parameters low enough that we don't have cavitation. And people have used a, uh, a metric called the mechanical index, which is defined as the peak negative pressure over the square root of the frequency to make sure that we stay under some threshold. But let's put this into perspective. This mechanical index is something that the FDA uses and it make, we, um, they require that uh, we use a, a threshold that we stay under a mechanical index of 1.9. Um, there, the, that the mechanical index parameter was established for long pulses and, uh, and not really, I don't think so much describing the rectified diffusion. Uh, sorry, it was, it was for short pulses, but we have long pulses. And also it was not really describing rectified diffusion, but like if there was a microbubble already there, then how does the ultrasound interact with that microbubble? And um, it's not necessarily what we think is relevant to rectified diffusion and our situation, but it is a metric that is used for safety by the FDA and probably something we need to stay under. <laughs> Do you remember what, what they uh, used to set that measure of like 1.9? Did they see tissue damage in a model or something like that? No, they were looking at bubble oscillation. And then it's sort of like the threshold for when the ultrasound will, will have a, an effect with the, with the bubbles. Um, well, like what would the effect be? Like why would it be considered a safety issue at some well, point? Mm. Yeah. Okay. So no, I'm not exactly sure where that one. Yeah, I don't came remember. From. I mean, I don't know either. I'm just wondering if you did. Maybe some, somebody can include that in a project if they work on this for the course. Okay. So let's back up a moment. Where are we? There is a thought that rectified diffusion can have an effect on transcranial ultrasound stimulation. And there's some naysayers. We'll put Keith in that category saying, hey, is this really happening? Is it happening in cell membrane and not outside? Um, and, and, um, and then lastly, there's a threshold that's kind of related to cavitation that we need to stay under. Okay. All right. So lastly, there's particle displacement is our physical mechanisms. And I don't really know what to say about that. Um, it's defined here. Basically the particle displacement is related to the pressure and one over the frequency. And Gavriloff did a lot of research in the early days in Russia, and he correlated particle displacement with thresholds to elicit finger sensations. So there's definitely a relationship uh, with uh, pressure over frequency. And, but I have a hard time. And again, that's something that we might think about as we look at the next few, not, not the upcoming lecture, but the lectures um, after that is to like, how could a particle displacement be having a, a physical effect, a biophysical effect? So something yeah, to think it's about. It's also, it's like not common that you know, people will talk about wavelength and stuff like that, but you, I mean, what would you need to know how much the actual particles are moving when the wave travels through them? You'd probably need like stiffness and, and other things in an equation to back that out, right? Yeah, well, it's, it's, it's given up there. Um, so it's just density and speed of sound, intensity, frequency. Okay, so you can like, is you here like actually the the net displacement or what, what does that mean here? Yeah. Yeah. In one direction around the mean or both? Um, Double yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. So you can get it. There you go. Yeah. I don't, I don't know. I mean, it's small, right? Like what is it? What is typical in a cell? Nanometers? Yeah. I think these are small. Like yeah. Really, really tiny. But the membrane is like 10 nanometers or like five to 10 nanometers. So it's you know, it's enough to move it one membrane away, right? Like if it's 10 nanometers. So it's something to consider.
Yes, it's something to consider. And does it by itself create those strains? Are yeah. we looking at strain on the order of, you know, the membrane or strains on the order of millimeters that we get at the focal spot? Yeah. Yeah, interesting. I don't know. I don't know. Yeah. All right. Well, let's review some of the data for or against. And I don't have that much data here because, um, you know, I would say there hasn't been a ton of systematic study here. Um, I'll show you some of the work that we did, and um, and I'll describe that in just a moment. So first of all, uh, I've lined up here our four candidates for our physical effect, temperature, radiation, force, cavitation, and particle displacement. And then what is the dependence on pressure, and what is the dependence on frequency? And you can see that they have different effects, whether it's the pressure squared, the pressure, or in cavitation is the peak negative pressure which is probably the same as the peak positive pressure. Since we're talking about low intensities, there's probably not a lot of nonlinear effects. Um, and then we see the frequency dependence. So many, the first two are linear related to frequency. The displacement is one over the frequency and the cavitation uh, one over the square root of the frequency. So what we did was we looked in our mouse model, we had EMGs in the forelimb, we applied ultrasound to their heads over the motor cortex, and then we looked at the twitch. And then we asked about the success rate in the twitch. And when we, we varied the frequencies and we varied the intensities. Specifically, what we looked at was the temperature and the force. The equations are given there. They're very similar to what I've shown in the table. Um, uh, the exponential and the frequency was ever so slightly different. It was linear, both of them are, are very similar. They have the same dependence. So we can't tell the difference between temperature and, and radiation force here. But we did actually look at the focal spots and, and try to derive a strain metric. I'll show you that in a moment. We looked at MI, so that's the peak negative pressure over the square root of frequency. We looked at the cavitation index, which is the peak negative pressure over the frequency, and then the particle displacement. So the ones in green are essentially the same. Can't really tell the difference between them. So it's uh, pressure over frequency. And the ones in purple are the same. Can't tell the difference between them for basically what we did. What we found was that uh, this is the intensity given for a certain success rate. And so what we see is as you increase the frequency, you need more intensity for that same success rate, um, which means that over here at the higher frequencies, it's, it's less effective. If you need a lower intensity at the low frequencies, then the ultrasound is more effective. So that's really, was really interesting. And so um, here, what we have is we split out for the different effects. And for example, if we look at the here in A, the spatial peak intensity, we see a very poor correlation with uh, our results. So we're looking at success rate in the vertical axis, intensity that we applied on the um, uh, horizontal axis, and, and we have the different frequencies. And we've, we've looked at the spatial peak intensity it has a, a terrible, um, relationship. So that's unlikely to have been uh, the causative physical mechanism. Um, so let's see, we look at mechanical index, the, the correlation here 0.18 was, was okay. Not as good as if you look over here, there's cavitation index and then the maximum particle displacement. Those had better correlations. In fact, those are the best of all. Um, peak radiation force, not very well correlated. Peak normal strain, not very well correlated. Peak shear strain, not correlated. So um, from this, we sort of calculated that pressure over frequency had the best correlation. Um, that being said, it was then pointed out that we didn't do a good job of taking into account the fact that there were different um, uh, focal spot areas at the different frequencies, and we didn't take that into account. And so you can imagine if you have a very small focal spot over the motor cortex, you have to have more intensity to have an effect than if you have a larger focal spot. And we didn't do, we, we didn't really kind of take that into account. And then there was some follow-up work that um, Mike Menz did with Steve Backus. Um, he not only looked at his results in the retina, but he also looked at our work. We'll talk about that one first. Um, our work where he removed the frequency, the, the focal spot dependence of frequency, and then found that uh, it had a relationship more like what he saw in the retina. What did he see in the retina? He found that at lower frequencies shown in, in black, that he had to apply more intensity to have an effect 
than at the higher frequencies shown in blue and in red. So that means the higher frequencies were more effective. So he concluded that uh, radiation force was more likely to be the mechanism. And then especially when he took into account the focal spot size from our work, that it was more likely to be the mechanism. Um, so at this point, I'd say, you know, data is a little conflicting. First of all, I'm not sure that we had a very good model for studying this. It was, you know, the whole animal and whether or not the, the mouse uh, moved. We were using rectangular waveforms. We know there's an auditory confound since we didn't use smoothed waveforms back then. Um, and I really think it would be useful to redo a study like this, but to do a better study. Um, potentially looking at GCAMP would give you, you know, um, signal that's at a lower level, you know, closer to the neurons. Although we could argue whether it's really that low a level, and, and maybe we need to do a study that's like looking even more specifically at at, at the neuronal response. Um, yeah, I think I think whatever you're stimulating should be like much smaller than the field, so that you get rid of that problem. Like just really small amount of tissue make the field huge, but. I'm like wondering, Kim, do you know why intuitively higher frequencies have higher radiation force or deposition of like energy? Just, yeah, just so we covered that. that earlier in the lecture. <laughs> no, I know we did, but but like I know that you showed, you know, it's sort of that it does happen. That displacement has to do with the absorption and the absorption has a frequency dependence. Why though? Why does absorption have a frequency dependence? Yeah. Oh, is that like a friction um, thing because it's moving more per time, like a friction. Uh, like yeah, there's time. more resistance to that motion as you go up in frequency. As the frequency gets higher, this is more resistance. So I think it, yeah, it has to do with that. Oh, because you're trying to move it faster than sort of the environment is like naturally wanting to go. Yeah, something. that's how I okay. like to think about it. Yeah, that's interesting. So at this point, I think all we can really conclude is that we have a, some data points that uh, point in, in different directions, and we're still looking for a conclusive study. All right. All right. So let's go on here. I'm almost done. No definitive answer here for what is the physical mechanism. Could be a combination. That's so, so that's a, a point that you keep making, Keith. Oh, yeah. Of course. I mean, it's definitely a, a combination. Like you can't really have one of these systems have an effect and just none of the others do anything. I mean, you would agree with that, right, Kim? Yeah. Yeah. And, and there's things that I don't fully understand. Um, we know that there's uh, temperature sensitive ion channels, but how could our ion channels be sensitive to temperatures that are fractions of a degree C that are well within the range of, of, a, of, of a fever? Mm -hmm. I mean, we, I, I mean, um, you know, just to play devil's advocate to my own question, we know that when people have a very high fever that they can end up in seizures and, and you know, it affects the brain. And so that we know, but then when there's a very small temperature rise, you know, is, is, there, is there a time dependence? Like it has, if it's a small temperature rise, but it happens very quickly, you know, how does, so. Oh. I'll talk about this later. It could be really fun. So Kim and I did this in a review recently, but we talked about other works who had shown that even a fraction of a degree had substantial effects on neuronal activity. Um, and people do that using like lasers or little like thermistor probes and things like that. Um, it would be interesting to review the whole breadth of literature to show uh, some sort of normalized change in neural activity relative to a temperature shift. And then to overlay that with our own work, mm -hmm. thinking out loud here, that would be fun, yeah. right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so we need more study, need to vary one time, one parameter at a time, keeping the others constant. <laughs> yes, very difficult to do. <laughs> Easier said than done. Yeah. Okay, so, um, and then just before I conclude, uh, we did mention the standardized reporting initiative. And so this is something that um, I've been involved with and need to get going on that manuscript. But um, some of the things that we are suggesting that are what we should be reporting in our papers. And now that the students have heard the whole lecture, this is gonna make sense to them. People should be reporting their spatial peak pressure from their scan tank, uh, how they do their derating, and then what their estimate is for their in-situ pressure. 
Um, if they uh, use acoustic uh, impedance, they should say what they're using. Uh, the, um, there is a thought that they should be reporting peak rarefraction pressure, although <sighs> I'm just not clear um, how a scan tank measurement of the negative pressure relates to the negative pressure you get in the brain. Because water goes nonlinear very quickly. So it maybe has a nonlinear effect that is much bigger than what you see in the brain because the brain's gonna like filter out the nonlinearity and it's gonna end up going back to um, a nice fundamental. Um, so sort of a bit of a digression there that I gotta work out before I write this paper. Okay, so uh, we've talked about um, temperature. There are a couple of metrics that people have been working on in diagnostic ultrasound and that we're kind of working on here as well for uh, kind of relating temperature. These are not temperature, but they're related to temperature. So there's the, uh, so what's called a thermal index at the focus and a thermal index in the cranium and they're related to temperature. It's a way that you can kind of look at one set of parameters versus another and say, this one's more likely to have heating than that one. But anyway, so we're just trying to say that those metrics should probably stay under two degrees C and the brought two degrees C into it because that's what the safety standard is for heating with MRI. Uh, the MI, we want to keep that to be consistent with what it is currently for diagnostic ultrasound at 1.9. And then the last two are the intensity integrals. And one of them is the intensity integral over the stimulus. We, we don't know that this is the causative uh, physical mechanism is intensity. In, in fact, we, we just looked at data that said it was pressure. Um, over frequency. But anyway, we think that this is something that probably we should get in the habit of reporting because it, it may be useful in terms of the efficacy of the stimulus. And then lastly, the intensity integral over the experiment. And we don't know if this has a safety implication. And so we also think that this might be something that we probably should report, um, even though we don't know just yet. And that's it. So that's the end of the lecture. You still with me, Keith? I'm with you. <laughs> so, all right. Any last questions before we finish, before we, we wrap up? Not, not from my end. Um, hopefully, yeah, hopefully everyone is excited by the uncertainty rather than sort of scared, scared off by it. <laughs> Right, right, right. It just seems that there's more research to be done, and it means that it's an exciting field and dynamic and stuff still to learn. Yeah, neuroscience in general like tends to be that way, that anyone can step in and make like high-impact work. There's just so much unknown and so many tools available. It's really fun. Good time to make high-impact work, yeah. yeah. Okay, so I'm going to stop there. Great. Thanks so much, Kim.